Book two, chapters three and four of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Book two, chapter three. Art or Science of War. One. Usage still unsettled. Power and knowledge. Science when mere knowing art when doing is the object the choice between these terms seems to be still unsettled and no one seems to know rightly on what grounds it should be decided and yet the thing is simple we have already said elsewhere that knowing is something different from doing the two are so different that they should not easily be mistaken the one for the other the doing cannot properly stand in any book and therefore also art should never be the title of a book but because we have once accustomed ourselves to combine in conception under the name of theory of art or simply art the branches of knowledge which may be separately pure sciences necessary for the practice of an art therefore it is consistent to continue this ground of distinction and to call everything art when the object is to carry out the doing being able as for example art of building science when merely knowledge is the object as science of mathematics of astronomy that in every art certain complete sciences may be included is intelligible of itself and should not perplex us but still it is worth observing that there is also no science without a mixture of art in mathematics for instance the use of figures and of algebra is an art but this is only one amongst many instances the reason is that however plain and palpable the difference is between knowledge and power in the composite results of human knowledge yet it is difficult to trace out their line of separation in man himself two difficulty of separating perception from judgment art of war all thinking is indeed art where the logician draws the line where the premises stop which are the result of cognition where judgment begins their art begins but more than this even the perception of the mind is judgment again and consequently art and at last even the perception by the senses as well in a word if it is impossible to imagine a human being possessing merely the faculty of cognition devoid of judgment or the reverse so also art and science can never be completely separated from each other the more these subtle elements of light embody themselves in the outward forms of the world so much the more separate appear their domains and now once more where the object is the creation and production there is the province of art where the object is investigation and knowledge science holds sway after all this it results of itself that it is more fitting to say art of war than science of war so much for this because we cannot do without these conceptions but now we come forward with the assertion that war is neither an art nor a science in the real signification and that it is just the setting out from the starting point of ideas which has led to a wrong direction being taken which has caused war to be put on par with other arts and sciences and has led to a number of erroneous analogies this has indeed been felt before now and on that it was maintained that war is a handicraft but here there was more loss than gained by that for a handicraft is only an inferior art and as such is also subject to definite and rigid laws in reality the art of war did go on for some time in the spirit of a handicraft we allude to the times of the condottieri but then it received that direction not from intrinsic but from external causes and military history shows how little it was at that time in accordance with the nature of the thing three war is part of the intercourse of the human race we say therefore war belongs not to the province of arts and sciences but to the province of social life it is a conflict of great interests which is settled by bloodshed and only in that is it different from others it would be better instead of comparing it with any art to liken it to business competition which is also a conflict of human interests and activities and it is still more like state policy which again on its part may be looked upon as a kind of business competition on a great scale besides state policy is the womb in which war is developed in which its outlines lie hidden in a rudimentary state like the qualities of living creatures in their germs four difference 
the essential difference consists in this that war is no activity of the will which exerts itself upon inanimate matter like the mechanical arts or upon a living but still passive and yielding subject like the human mind and the human feelings in the ideal arts but against a living and reacting force how little the categories of arts and sciences are applicable to such an activity strikes us at once and we can understand at the same time how the constant seeking and striving after laws like those which may be developed out of the dead material world could not but lead to constant errors and yet it is just the mechanical arts that some people would imitate in the art of war the imitation of the ideal arts was quite out of the question because these themselves dispense too much with laws and rules and those hitherto tried always acknowledged as insufficient and one-sided are perpetually undermined and washed away by the current of opinions feelings and customs whether such a conflict of the living as takes place and is settled in war is subject to general laws and whether these are capable of indicating a useful line of action will be partly investigated in this book but so much is evident in itself that this like every other subject which does not surpass our powers of understanding may be lighted up and be made more or less plain in its inner relations by an inquiring mind and that alone is sufficient to realize the idea of a theory chapter four methodicism in order to explain ourselves clearly as to the conception of method and method of action which plays such an important part in war we must be allowed to cast a hasty glance at the logical hierarchy through which as through regularly constituted official functionaries the world of action is governed law in the widest sense strictly applying to perception as well as action has plainly something subjective and arbitrary in its literal meaning and expresses just that on which we and those things external to us are dependent as a subject of cognition law is the relation of things and their effects to one another as a subject of the will it is a motive of action and it is then equivalent to command or prohibition principle is likewise a law for action except that it has no formal definite meaning but it is only the spirit and sense of law in order to leave the judgment more freedom of application when the diversity of the real world cannot be laid hold of under the definite form of law as the judgment must of itself suggest the cases in which the principle is not applicable the latter therefore becomes in that way a real aid or guiding star for the person acting principle is objective when it is the result of an objective truth and consequently of equal value for all men it is subjective and then generally called maxim if there are subjective relations in it and if it therefore has a certain value only for the person himself who makes it rule is frequently taken in the sense of law and then means the same as principle for we say no rule without exceptions but we do not say no law without exceptions a sign that with rule we retain to ourselves more freedom of application in another meaning rule is the means used of discerning a recondite truth in a particular sign lying close at hand in order to attach to this particular sign the law of action directed upon the whole truth of this kind are all the rules of games of play all the bridge processes in mathematics and such directions and instructions are determinations of action which have an influence upon a number of minor circumstances too numerous and unimportant for general laws lastly method mode of acting is an always recurring proceeding selected out of several possible ones and methodicism methodismus is that which is determined by methods instead of by general principles or particular prescriptions by this the cases which are placed under such methods must necessarily be supposed alike in their essential parts as they cannot all be this then the point is that at least as many as possible should be in other words that method should be calculated on the most probable cases methodicism is therefore not founded on determined particular premises but on the average probability of cases one with another and its ultimate tendency is to set up an average truth the constant and uniform application of which soon acquires something of the nature of a mechanical appliance which in the end does that which is right almost unwittingly the conception of law in relation to perception is not necessary for the conduct of war because the complex phenomena of war are not so regular 
and the regular are not so complex that we should gain anything more by this conception than by the simple truth and where a simple conception and language is sufficient to resort to the complex becomes affected and pedantic the conception of law in relation to action cannot be used in the theory of the conduct of war because owing to the variableness and diversity of the phenomena there is in it no determination of such a general nature as to deserve the name of law but principles rules prescriptions and methods are conceptions indispensable to a theory of the conduct of war in so far as that theory leads to positive doctrines because in doctrines the truth can only crystallize itself in such forms as tactics is the branch of the conduct of war in which theory can attain the nearest to positive doctrine therefore these conceptions will appear in it most frequently not to use cavalry against unbroken infantry except in some case of special emergency only to use firearms within effective range in the combat to spare the forces as much as possible for the final struggle these are tactical principles none of them can be applied absolutely in every case but they must be present to the mind of the chief in order that the benefit of the truth contained in them may not be lost in cases where that truth can be of advantage if from the unusual cooking by an enemy's camp his movement is inferred if the intentional exposure of troops in a combat indicates a false attack then this way of discerning the truth is called a rule because from a single visible circumstance that conclusion is drawn which corresponds with the same if it is a rule to attack the enemy with renewed vigour as soon as he begins to limber up his artillery in the combat then on this particular fact depends a course of action which is aimed at the general situation of the enemy as inferred from the above fact namely that he is about to give up the fight that he is commencing to draw off his troops and is neither capable of making a serious stand while thus drawing off nor of making his retreat gradually in good order regulations and methods bring preparatory theories into the conduct of war in so far as disciplined troops are inoculated with them as active principles the whole body of instructions for formations drill and field service are regulations and methods in the drill instructions the first predominate in the field service instructions the latter to these things the real conduct of war attaches itself it takes them over therefore as given modes of proceeding and as such they must appear in the theory of the conduct of war but for those activities retaining freedom in the employment of these forces there cannot be regulations that is definite instructions because they would do away with freedom of action methods on the other hand as a general way of executing duties as they arise calculated as we have said on an average of probability or as a dominating influence of principles and rules carried through to application may certainly appear in the theory of the conduct of war provided only they are not represented as something different from what they are not as the absolute and necessary modes of action systems but as the best of general forms which may be used as shorter ways in place of a particular disposition for the occasion at discretion but the frequent application of methods will be seen to be most essential and unavoidable in the conduct of war if we reflect how much action proceeds on mere conjecture or in complete uncertainty because one side is prevented from learning all the circumstances which influence the dispositions of the other or because even if these circumstances which influence the decisions of the one were really known there is not owing to their extent and the dispositions they would entail sufficient time for the other to carry out all the necessary counteracting measures that therefore measures in war must always be calculated on a certain number of possibilities if we reflect how numberless are the trifling things belonging to any single event and which therefore should be taken into account along with it and that therefore there is no other means to suppose the one counteracted by the other and to base our arrangements only upon what is of a general nature and probable if we reflect lastly owing to the increasing numbers of officers as we descend the scale of rank less must be left to the true discernment and ripe judgment of individuals the lower the sphere of action and that when we reach those ranks where we can look for no other notions but those which the regulations of the service and experience afford we must help them with the methodic forms bordering on those regulations this will serve both as a support to their judgment and a barrier against those extravagant and erroneous views which are so especially to be dreaded in a sphere where experience is so costly 
Besides this absolute need of method in action, we must also acknowledge that it has a positive advantage, which is that, through the constant repetition of a formal exercise, a readiness, precision, and firmness is attained in the movement of troops, which diminishes the natural friction and makes the machine move easier. Method will, therefore, be the more generally used, become the more indispensable, the farther down the scale of rank the position of the active agent, and on the other hand its use will diminish upwards until in the highest position it quite disappears. For this reason it is more in its place in tactics than in strategy. War in its highest aspects consists not of an infinite number of little events, the diversities in which compensate each other, and which therefore, by a better or worse method, are better or worse governed, but of separate great decisive events which must be dealt with separately. It is not like a field of stalks which, without any regard to the particular form of each stalk, will be mowed better or worse according as the mowing instrument is good or bad, but rather as a group of large trees, to which the axe must be laid with judgment according to the particular form and inclination of each separate trunk. How high up in military activity the admissibility of method in action reaches naturally determines itself not according to actual rank, but according to things, and it affects the highest positions in a less degree only because these positions have the most comprehensive subjects of activity. A constant order of battle, a constant formation of advance guards and outposts are methods by which a general ties not only his subordinates' hands, but also his own in certain cases. Certainly they may have been devised by himself, and may be applied by him according to circumstances, but they may also be a subject of theory in so far as they are based on the general properties of troops and weapons. On the other hand, any method by which definite plans for wars or campaigns are to be given out, already made as if from a machine, are absolutely worthless. As long as there exists no theory which can be sustained, that is, no enlightened treatise on the conduct of war, Method in action cannot but encroach beyond its proper limits in high places, for men employed in these spheres of activity have not always had the opportunity of educating themselves through study and through contact with the higher interests. In the impracticable and inconsistent disquisitions of theorists and critics, they cannot find their way, their sound common sense rejects them, and as they bring with them no knowledge but that derived from experience, therefore, in those cases which admit of and require a free individual treatment, they regularly make use of the means which experience gives them, that is, in an imitation of the particular methods practised by great generals, by which a method of action always arises of itself. If we see Frederick the Great's generals always making their appearance in the so-called oblique order of battle, the generals of the French Revolution always using turning movements with a long extended line of battle, and Bonaparte's lieutenants rushing to the attack with the bloody energy of concentrated masses, then we recognize in the recurrence of the mode of proceeding evidently an adopted method, and see therefore that method of action can reach up to regions bordering on the highest. Should an improved theory facilitate the study of the conduct of war, form the mind and the judgment of men who are rising to the highest commands, then also method in action will no longer reach so far, and so much of it as is to be considered indispensable will then at least be formed from theory itself, and not take place out of mere imitation. However preeminently a great commander does things, there is always something subjective in the way he does them, and if he has a certain manner, a large share of his individuality is contained in it, which does not always accord with the individuality of the person who copies his manner. At the same time, it would neither be possible nor right to banish subjective methodicism or manner completely from the conduct of war. It is rather to be regarded as a manifestation of that influence which the general character of a war has upon its separate events, and to which satisfaction can only be done, in that way, if theory is not able to foresee this general character and include it in its considerations. What is more natural than that the War of the French Revolution had its own way of doing things, and what theory could ever have included that peculiar method? The evil is only that such a manner originating in a special case easily outlives itself because it continues whilst circumstances imperceptibly change. This is what theory should prevent by lucid and rational criticism. When in the year 1806 the Prussian generals, Prince Louis at Saulfeld, Tor Ensign on the Dornberg near Jena, Grauwert before and Ruchel behind Kapellendorf, all threw themselves into the open jaws of destruction 
in the oblique order of Frederick the Great, and managed to ruin Hohenlohe's army in a way that no army was ever ruined, even on the field of battle. All this was done through a manner which had outlived its day, together with the most downright stupidity to which methodicism ever led. End of Book 2, Chapters 3 and 4 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia